inside China's new space station. What is this? Is this copyright? The space race. A Didn't we win the space race? Nah, the Soviet Union did. We, we got on the moon. That's pretty cool. Major milestone with their Tiangong space station, the third and final Mengtian research module was successfully docked to the station, bringing it up to full operation. Following the Tiangong's completion, I trust you, the Zen. Chinese Shenzhou 15 spacecraft arrived to complete the first in-orbit crew handover with a total of six Taikonauts living and working on the station for the first time. By this point, we're all pretty familiar with seeing people on the International Space Station, so we have a pretty good idea about living in space. But life for Chinese crews on the Tiangong is like nothing else we've seen before in human spaceflight. So, let's take a look at what they've been working on up there in space. This is the Space Race. The Tiangong now consists of three modules, forming a T-shaped space station that orbits- Holy shit, China's T-posing on the entire planet. What the fuck? We can't let them get away with this. Fire the nukes. Launch the missiles. ...around 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The Tianhe is the core command module, first launched in April 2021. The Wen Tian experiment module serves as a combination of crew quarters, research lab, and airlock, which was added in July 2022. New mission for X-37. Yeah, yeah, we altered the trajectory of an asteroid. Let's see if we can deorbit the space station. And the Meng Tian module is a twin to the Wen Tian and functions purely as a research and experiment space. The you know what they say about sex in space? It's far out, man. I, I, I am very curious. I, I would want to try... I know you can do, like... There are those, like, high-flying ships that do the free fall, and it's, being, it's like being in zero-G and you can fuck there, but it only lasts, like, 40 seconds, you know? I can't come in 40 seconds. I'm not, like, two-thirds of you. Uh, yeah, I, I gotta go... You can't get erections or it's really hard? Yeah, I bet you can't, right? Because your blood... Your 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 blood is operating on like an entirely different. You know what I mean? Like like so you you don't you don't really appreciate this unless unless you've been up in the ISS because the the space guys up there have written on it. But so many of our bodily systems are completely dependent on Earth's gravity. You know, like so much of the shit that we just naturally do falls apart without gravity. You know, they talk about stuff like like bone mass deterioration, but even less than that. I, I mean, even just very basic, like how your head feels, uh, how your body feels. You're feeling your organs slosh around in your body, man. Jeez. Sex is forbidden by NASA regulations. That would make sense. They do not want astronauts to fight with each other. Your bladder has to be full to feel any urge to pee because urine floats, floats in a ball inside your bladder. That is fucked. That is fucked up. That is fucked up. That is fucked up. Holy shit. You've got like your bladder. I don't know what a bladder looks like. And it's it, 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 the, the, the urine is being filtered through your blood from the kidneys or whatever. I don't know how the body works. And it's going out and it's all joining this big like blob of piss that's just like blubbing about on the inside of your of of your your that this is disgust i hate this oh my god i hate this so much so the only way you could pee is if like the 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 urinary tract starts there you would need the ball to be so big that it came into contact with it and then you would have to rely on capillary action like liquid moving through a straw in order to push the whole bubble, the, the whole big piss orb out through. It, you would basically be like putting a straw to a blob of water floating in zero G and sucking it up, except instead it's the pressure from your urinary tract sucking it through, right? That's insane. There are piss muscles? Yeah, that's what creates the suction force. Wouldn't the muscles push it out? Yeah, that's the suction force from the urinary tract. I don't, I don't, I'm pretty sure it doesn't like, no, the muscles compress the bladder. 
But that's not the majority of what makes you piss, right? The compression of the bladder... Wait, hold, hold on. How much does the bladder compress? It can't be more than... than a portion... I'm not reading much on the compression. Guys, I think the muscle is about... I think the muscle is about moving the piss from the bottom of the bladder out through the urinary tract. Right? No? No, that's wrong. Wait. I can't believe I'm about to Google this unironically. How do you pee? The brain signals the bladder muscles to tighten, which squeezes urine out of the bladder. Okay, but how much does it compress? That's what I was looking for. Like, if, if the internal volume of a bladder maxes out at, like, one liter, I don't know if it's that, I'm just saying, can, you, can it be compressed to a half liter? A quarter liter? How, how much bladder muscles tightening the hypertonic pelvic floor occurs when the muscles in the pelvic okay how much can bladder muscles move the walls of the bladder are mainly formed by detrusor muscle which allows the bladder to contract to excrete urine or relax to hold women contract by how much how much can bladder contract it's just telling me how much it can expand. Just watch this video. Most how do you in space? No, no, I want to specifically know how much the muscles of the bladder cause the bladder volume-wise to contract. Look up volume of empty bladder. Volume of empty bladder. Is your bladder ever completely empty? Your, bl your bladder never completely empties. What? Okay, so it must be from constriction, because if it was gravity entirely, then there would... So it is from constriction. So, if it's saying that you're still going to have 50 milliliters of piss in your bladder after you're done peeing, is that then the internal volume at maximum constriction? You can't constrict your bladder more than 50 milliliters? Because if that's the case, that is a massive difference between a fully expanded and fully contracted bladder. I didn't realize the muscles of the bladder were that um, capable of... What? Wait! But this image is making it look like it just pours out like gravity. It contracts, but it just pours out? If it's pouring out, then why can't it all go out? Can you piss upside down? You can piss upside down, can't you? I don't think I've ever tried, but I feel like it's something I could do if I wanted to. Okay, I'm losing my mind right now. Let's just say that it's a mystery and science has not yet solved the P question, okay? I don't want to talk about this anymore. The first thing that you'll notice about the interior of the tank- There's not air in the bladder, that drawing is just wrong? Okay, wait. So the bladder will never contain anything other than P? The bladder doesn't have air as a way of diffusing pressure? You can pee blood? Okay, well you shouldn't pee blood. Only under unhealthy conditions will your bladder have air in it? Okay! Then if there can't be any gas in the bladder, then it must constrict entirely to an internal volume of 50 milliliters after you've finished peeing. When you pee from a full bladder to an empty bladder, it must literally be like a full balloon that constricts all the way down to a tiny little highly constricted muscle nugget with just a little bit of piss left in it. I didn't realize it was so spongy. Okay. That's what we've been saying. Yeah, but the I wasn't getting any like diagrams to indicate it constricted to that point. I was being shown a a a, a bladder that had uh, empty space in it outside of the pee. Then gravity shouldn't matter. Yeah, then gravity shouldn't matter. If you can constrict your bladders all the way down to an internal volume of fifty milliliters, then how would does zero g make peeing harder? Urination is caused by contraction of muscles, not by gravity. Today I learned low gravity makes it difficult to tell if your bladder is full because the bladder's stretch receptor doesn't feel the weight of the liquid. Okay, so being in zero G doesn't make it harder to pee. It makes it harder to know that you need to pee because you don't have the weight of the piss weighing down in your bladder. Your bladder still expands as it would normally. It's not just floating around in there. Uh, but it's not weighing at the bottom of it, which is how your body normally tells, because gravity indicates to your body the internal mass of the of the urine. Okay, 
So you would have the weird feeling of feeling like you don't have to pee at all, but then you would pee for like 40 seconds straight or something. Okay. That's not how that works. Yes, it is! Gong ...is that it looks spacious and wide open, especially when compared to the ISS. Tiangong has a very minimalist, modern design. What's interesting is that the outside diameter of the Tiangong modules are nearly the exact same as the diameter of the ISS modules, about 4.2 meters or 14 feet across. And how are they? So the difference is in the volume of internal space available. There are a few reasons for that. For one, the ISS modules are typically much shorter with more connection points in between that create bottlenecks in the structure. For example, the Destiny Lab on the ISS, which is the primary operating facility for U.S. astronauts, is 8.4 meters or 28 feet long, while the Wentian and the Mengtian modules are both 18 meters or 59 wow. feet in length. And secondly, the technology on Tiangong is just much more modern and therefore smaller and able when did the ISS get put up again? It was in the late 90s, right? It makes sense that the Chinese space station would be way more advanced than the uh, old one. ...to fit into smaller spaces. For example, many of the systems on Tiangong will connect wirelessly instead of having to run a labyrinth of cables around like what we see on the ISS. Also, much of the technology on the Tiangong is hidden behind these plain white panels when not in use. I don't know if that's more functional or aesthetic, or if they just don't want anyone else. Should the American one be updated? Um, I don't. Oh, that's a tech question. I'm. I'm not a wizard. I don't know. Supposed to be able to see what they're working on, but it does help make the station look very clean. And Wait, hold on. What they're work more. Fun I'm smelling Tesla bullshit functional or aesthetic, or if they just don't want anyone else to be able to see what they're working on, but it does help make the station look very clean and modern. Okay, again, totally not a tech expert. However, I'm sure the stuff in the Chinese station is a lot more modern too. However, I think you could say there are very legitimate reasons for why the inside of the ISS looks like this. Like, I have heard about, like, in terms of modularity, repairing, uh, identifying issues, I think that having, like, all this exposed stuff has been written on to be better. I could be totally wrong. I feel like the potential downside of having everything covered up like this, even though it obviously looks way nicer and is easier to move around, and the tech is probably a lot newer, is that it might be a little bit more of a kind of black box, I guess, in terms of, like, oh, something's wrong, tear out all the panels, what's going on? I don't know. I'm always suspicious of anything that looks like it cuts down on visual complexity for the modern or sleek aesthetic. That might just be the way it's being presented by this channel, though. And again, like, the people who designed this were geniuses, and I am not, so. Spacewalks have become an exciting feature of life on the Tiangong. There are three of China's own EVA suits on the station, kept in the Wentian airlock, Spacewalks are helped out by a combination of two robotic arms on the station. The Tianhe module has a 10 meter arm, and Wen Tian has its own 5 meter arm. Who was the first person who did the unassisted spacewalk? 35 years ago, the first untethered spacewalk. The fucking brass balls on this guy, dude. Holy shit. Bruce McCandless made history performing a spacewalk during STS-41B with no lifelines tethering him to the space shuttle Challenger. He used a jetpack? Yeah, yeah, like with the gas to propel him back. Used a man maneuvering unit? Yep, like in Kerbal Space Program. McCandless and astronaut Bob Stewart completed separate untethered spacewalks during the mission, both venturing more than 300 feet from the Challenger? Fuck that! You're moving it like... 500 miles per second above the Earth. Jesus Christ. You're moving faster than a bullet? Oh, far faster, yeah. Jesus Christ. Isn't that dangerous because of space debris? Well, at, at, the, at the orbit of... At the orbit this was done at, I don't think they were that worried about space debris, but it could happen, yeah. Yeah, his, his brass balls gravitationally paired him to the shuttle, exactly. He could just jetpack back to, back to Earth if he got lost. Yeah, the fucked up thing, right, is that if a spacewalk goes wrong and you can't make it back to the ship and nobody can rescue you, you don't fall back to Earth. 
you stay up there and freeze slash starve slash whatever. You, you die in several ways up there. Oxygen would be the first one, right? Yeah. Uh, and you just float and you just become part of the orbit. Like, basically forever? Yeah, you would... Cars beat. Depends on the trajectory. Well, I assume that if they're doing this from the ISS or from the Tenshan, the or Tiangong station, they would be in the same, uh, you know, orbit. China wants to have a legit moon colony in the 2030s, and their space program has been very successful so far, so we'll see. I'm rooting for them. I mean, I don't like the Chinese government, but it's not like I'm crazy about the American government, you know? I, I, a, a moon base would be awesome. The cool thing about a moon base is that, like, a Mars base would be a sickening waste of time and money and human life. Uh, but a moon base could actually be useful. It could actually be really, really cool and useful as a fuel depot and a construction site that you could use to cheaply get stuff into orbit. Imagine, like, there are so many materials that go into space production and flight that you could restock on the moon, and then you could just leave the moon's orbit with no fucking effort. Because if you want to get up from the Earth. If you want to get into Earth orbit, not only is the gravity way stronger, but you also have to get through the fucking atmosphere. But from the moon, there is no atmosphere. The gravity is like one-sixth out of Earth? One, one-sixth, I think? So you could just zoop. I think so, uh, Zan. Hey, Vosh, aerospace engineer here. The main stuff we leave stuff exposed like that is one, maintenance access, and two, covers for that stuff are wasted weight. You have to spend a lot of fuel. Oh, yeah, that's true. Every additional pound of shit you want to put into orbit is like five billion trillion quadrillion dollars. Like, they'll have you take a piss before you get on the rocket just to make sure that all their fucking toilet receptacles are empty because that will cost that much more fuel getting you into orbit. It's, it's so much more, yeah. This is why uh, having a moon base would be super useful. Do you think they make you jerk off too? Brah, empty those fucking balls before you get up here. They, you're in the purge room. They have a bunch of, like, NASA fluffers furiously jerking you off while you're making yourself throw up and shit and piss at the same time. You just go up there, like, gaunt, uh, 20 pounds lighter. And what's really cool is that the two can combine together and function as one single arm. This comes pretty close to matching the capabilities of the 17 meter long Canada Arm 2 on the ISS, and in a lot of ways the dual arm system of the Tiangong is much more useful. The 15 meter arm was used in a recent spacewalk in mid-November, where the crew in- Okay, yeah, so just for comparison, uh, the fuel ratio, um, fuel ratio taking off from Earth to orbit the fuel ratio like how many pounds of fuel you need eight eight pounds of rocket fuel to get every one pound of thing into low earth orbit uh so so for so for every guy which is 200 pounds that's fucking 1600 pounds of it's it, it, so it's it, like it's a lot you know but from the moon it's about a one-to-one -one ratio uh to leave the surface of the moon uh, the weight of fuel is about 50% the total weight, which is, like, ridiculously efficient in comparison. Another cool thing about a moon base is that you could have um, Wi-Fi there. You could also beam energy there pretty easily, right? That's a real technology. When they beam, like, light, you could, like, have a laser. The moon's close enough that you could probably do that from, um, uh, uh, like, that's that's, like, a reasonable tech thing, you know, like, focusing sun rays or whatever. Or you could just set up some solar panels up there. I mean, it's just about as far from the sun as the Earth is, so you can do that. And you could get Wi-Fi. Like, how, how far is the moon? Hold on, wait. Internet speeds from the moon. Using four six-inch diameter telescopes to beam pulses of infrared light to a satellite circling the moon, scientists... Dude! Scientists established a solid connection with a speed of 19 megabytes per second down. Bro, you could download Steam games off that. This is from 2014. This is from eight years ago. Hell yeah. From the Smithsonian mag back in 2014, you can now get high-speed internet on the moon. You could watch me. What about the delay? The delay wouldn't be that bad, right? I mean, speed of light. Uh... Yeah, yeah, tw 240,000 miles is, is peanuts to the speed of light. Two second delay? Yeah, that's pretty doable. Just one second, you won't be able to play online games. Okay, so you're not going to be playing Valorant or whatever, but you can still have fun. 
installed a series of intermodule connection devices, basically a series of handrails, that will allow them to easily traverse around the exterior of all three modules. As far as the cruise experience- Oh, it's, it's 19 megabits, not 19 megabytes? Oh, okay, that's a lot slower. But that's still better than a lot of people's internet is today. ...experience inside the Tiangong, one of the few things that really stands out is all of the footholds that are mounted onto the floor. I don't know if that's a weird thing to pick up on, but we're always used to seeing crews on the ISS just floating around all the time. But the Chinese- This seems like a really good idea. I feel like that what one of the things they do on the ISS is they have floor lights from one side specifically to give the impression of a floor and a ceiling, even though there really isn't. This feels like a good idea, right? Because humans are meant... Humans are not meant to be in zero G and probably never will be. Um, it's probably good for us to simulate those conditions. They really seem to prefer to keep their feet on the floor. So they yeah. are usually strapped in and not just free floating. Whenever you see them posing for group photos, they are always standing up straight. The crew also sleeps straight up. Another awesome thing on the moon is the helium-3 deposits we can use for easier fusion. Oh yeah, true. The moon has lots of helium-3 because of all of the radiation from the sun um, bombarding the surface. Unlike Earth, which is protected by a magnetic field, the moon has been bombarded with large quantities of helium-3 by the solar wind. It's thought this isotope could provide safer nuclear energy in a fusion reactor since it's not radioactive and would not produce waste products. Um, so, hype, like, theoretically, you could use the helium-3 on the moon to kickstart, like, a new era of energy. The moon has plenty of ice. Yeah, you can make fuel there. God, can you imagine having the, um, having the moon as a refueling base? Anytime you needed fuel, rather than the 8 to 1 fuel ratio of Earth, you would have the 1 to 1 that you could use from the moon to maintain, like, orbital shit. That'd be really cool. Why haven't we colonized the moon? Well, it's pretty expensive. I thought that was a made-up plot point in Iron Sky. No, it's a real thing. I know helium-3 is rare on Earth, but this doesn't seem cost-effective. Oh, no, 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 no. Trust me. If they could establish helium-3 mining on the moon, it would the people in charge of that would become some of the wealthiest humans in history. Um, helium-3 would be the bedrock of, like, anybody with their finger on the pulse of modern, like, fusion energy development would end up being one of the most powerful humans in history. Uh, yeah, it would be, it would be an unimaginable, yeah, incomparable to anything on Earth at any point in history. I don't think anything even compares. Moon money. And yeah, this was just a couple months ago. China has returned helium-3 from the moon, opening the door to future technology. This was a huge deal. Their Chang'e 5 mission has returned a new mineral from the lunar surface. Um, called mineral chengisite. The minerals were described as a... The Chinese claim the new mineral contains helium-3, an isotope that many scientists have touted as a potential fuel for future fusion reactors. The crystal mineral was exceedingly tiny, about one-tenth the size of a human hair. The new mineral is of intense interest to lunar geologists. Interesting. Chengisite. So they're calling it chengisite because of the Chengi mission? That's cool. Finders uh, naming rights, right? Chengisite Y, with a chemical formula, wow, I don't know how to read this, is a mineral found forming colorless transparent columnar crystals and basalt, basalt particles on the moon. Chengisite Y is a member of the mirrorlite group of phosphate minerals. Well, that's cool. That's a little bit beyond me, though. A little bit beyond my pay grade. Here's why Chengisite Y could fuel a gold rush for lunar mining. Its chemical composition contains helium-3, a heavier isotope of helium that exists naturally within the Earth's crust, but is now becoming exceedingly rare on our planet. Wasn't this all very overblown how valuable it is? No, no, no. So, to like, this is my very limited understanding of fusion. But the basic idea is that scientists want to use a laser that fires particles to hit other particles. You have a target particle and the one you're firing. And the technology to fire these particles is really complicated because you need to fire them very accurately and also at like a third the speed of light. <laughs> you have to fi you have to accelerate these particles to like um like relativistic speeds basically. Uh in order for them to there's uh, let me do the simplify, okay? So, you have to you have to sling them along real quick, okay? And the thing is is that 
different isotopes of the same element or mineral can have wildly different properties when it comes to how easily you can shoot that shit through a particle accelerator. And the thing is with helium-3 is that it's basically like gold. Like, it's the right weight, it's non-radioactive, it's ideal. It's not ideal in the sense of like, we might find a better solution in the future. It might be ideal like, as a physical property of the universe. Like, in the same way that if you found a material that was 100% conductive, you would never find anything better than that. Like, 100% conductivity is the most conductive anything can be, and helium-3 might be the best fusion reactor starter that you can get, like, as a property of the universe. You know, there might not be a way to surpass that, at least not with our current understanding of how fusion reactors would work, I guess. So that's why it's really valuable. It's basically like, it's the good shit, you know? It's the good shit, I think. Yeah. How viable could moon mining be? Um, pretty viable, potentially. You can have drones that, uh, or, or like rovers that skim the surface of the moon autonomously and bring back payloads uh, they sift through. I mean, think basically of Dune, except on a smaller scale, and you would kind of get what we're trying to do here, right? And not to say we could do it like right now or even next year, but it's definitely something that could be done with current technology if we invested enough money into it. Yeah, basically just imagine those those giant vehicles in Dune that were skimming the surface uh, uh, for, for spice, okay? It, you have this, except at like one one-hundredth the scale. And they're looking for helium-3 instead of spice, and you've got it, okay? There is kind of a parallel, because spice fuels interstellar travel, uh, and uh, helium-3 would fuel everything, so it kind of, you know, it fits. How much is there on the moon, though? How much helium-3 is on the moon? What it's, what's worth noting is that helium-3 isn't rare. We just have a magnetosphere around Earth. It's rare to us. It's rare for us. But it's not rare universally. It's been estimated there are around 1.1 million metric tons of helium-3 on the surface of the moon down to a depth of a few meters. That's pretty cool. You don't need that much uh, helium-3 to do fusion, after all. I mean, you don't need... It's not like oil, you know? You don't, like, get a gallon of helium-3. Yeah, it's, it's all over the place. What happens when we run out? Well, ideally, yeah, the moons of Jupiter have a ton of it, too. And keep in mind that the energy contained within even a tenth of this, helium-3, if you could use it for fusion, this would be enough energy to catapult humanity into an entire another fucking tier civilizationally. Like, the, the energy just here on the surface of the moon, if used properly in fusion, assuming fusion technology gets worked out, um, isn't helium inert? Yes, it's non-radioactive. You could do a lot with that. It's the the energy potential of fusion. I mean, you're literally making a star. Literally. The only place in the universe that fusion happens normally is in stars. We're making a star on the planet. We already have. We've done fusion. It just hasn't been energy efficient yet. We're getting there. There are other planetary bodies with a lot of it. Is there helium-3 on Jupiter? One earlier estimate. Helium-3, helium-4. How much helium-3 would it take to power the U.S.? Scientists estimate that 25 tons of helium-3 could power the United States for a single year. This amount of helium-3 could be transported from the moon to the Earth in a ship the size of the recently retired space shuttle. So, yeah, this would be, this would be enough for the planet for a long time, even a portion of it. But there's more. Where can we find helium-3? Not just on the moon, but there are other, other places. Um, Lunar surface, terrestrial abundance. What about other places? Extraterrestrial. Here we go. Last thing, then we finish the video. Sorry about the delay. Materials on the moon's surface contain helium-3 at concentrations between 1.4 and 15 parts per billion in sunlit areas. Fusion. Gas giants. Mining gas giants for helium-3 has been proposed. The British Interplanetary Society's hypothetical Project Daedalus, great name, Interstellar probe design was fueled by helium-3 mines in the atmosphere of Jupiter, uh, for example. Does it, on Jupiter, does it have a compositional breakdown involving helium-3? 
Jupiter's upper atmosphere is 10% helium by volume. What about helium-3? Huh? Nah. It's okay. There's a lot of it out there. How rare is helium-3? I've read about this. It's, it's light stable isotope. Scientists discover unexplained abundance of rare nuclear fusion fuel on Earth. Helium-3, a potential source of limitless energy, may be ten times more common on our planet than previously thought. Well, that'd be cool. If helium-3 is so good, why isn't there a helium-4? There is, actually. This ratio is about 1 to 10,000, or 100 parts of helium-3 per million parts of... Whoa, wait, really? Wait! Jupiter's upper atmosphere has 100 parts per million of helium-3? That's a fuck ton. That's an infinite amount. 100 parts per million? That, that's, that's infinite helium-3. From Jupiter? Off the helium-3 Wikipedia, yes. Did I just miss that? Oh my god! That's infinite! That's literally infinite. You could, you, this, this is, this is infinite. Ratio about 1 to 10,000 or 100 parts of helium-3 per million parts of helium-4. Roughly the same ratio of isotopes in lunar regolith, which can uh, terrestrial say. God damn. Jupiter's escape velocity, though. Oh no, I, th that's a far future thing. You know, uh, it's a it's a far 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 future thing. Just wild. Lamb moths. Thank you so much for the fifty dollars. I really 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 appreciate that. Thank you. Random curious question. What are your top three favorite animals? Um, probably the ones I own. Right, cats, crested geckos, and um. Leopard geckos, because I have them, you know? They're cute. Oh, I had leopard geckos, the ones we had past, because they're dumb and old. The economics of mining Jupiter, though? Well, maybe Jupiter's moons would have it. I mean, if Jupiter has a lot of helium-3, it makes sense they might have some as well. At least it makes sense to me. Anyway, anyway, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for the $50. I really, really appreciate that. Here, come on, let's finish this video. We've had a, we've, 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 it's a good stun lock. It's a good stun lock. Up and down in a bag in one of six bunk areas. They're like a little alcove with a curtain that gives each person their own living quarters. There are three quarters in the core module and three more in the Wen Tian module. The standard crew count for the station will be three people, but that does expand to six for a few days during crew handover periods. Life has so far looked pretty comfortable for Tiangong crews. They are growing fresh lettuce and vegetables on board and they get oh, that's cute. supplies of fresh fruit like apples. Tiangong even has the first space microwave. Gallon's aerospace microwave oven was developed in China over a period of 10 years. It doesn't sound like much, but it is a pretty big deal to have a microwave that's usable in space. The ISS has never had one because the power draw would be too high. They use a food warming machine that adds hot water to their freeze-dried food packets, but it takes like 20 to 30 minutes to heat up. The space microwave on Tiangong can heat up a meal for three crew members in just seven minutes. It had to be specifically designed not just to run on very low power, but also to survive the stress of a launch on the Long March 5B rocket. Working out is also- <laughs> Hey, though. Uh, I'm waiting for Kerbal 2 to come out, though. When Kerbal 2 comes out, I'm going to be playing that shit for sure. So really key to health while living in space. Crew members on the ISS have to exercise for at least two hours every day. It's important to maintain as much muscle and bone density as possible, and regular exercise also helps to prevent fluids from building up in the person's head. The Tiangong Sheesh. has a special treadmill and cycling station for cardio, pretty similar to what we've seen before on the ISS. The newer Chinese equipment is just much smaller and more integrated into the design. And for resistance training, the new Mengtian research module came equipped with a rowing machine. This is nope. a bit different from the resistance machine they use on the ISS. That one allows the crew to perform movements that are really similar to squats and deadlifts with up to 600 pounds of resistance. I can't imagine any- No shot your average American would be able to live in space. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. You need to be- Astronauts are literally in peak physical condition. You need to be like a-, a physically a superior human you have to be a, like an athlete to even survive in space for a length of time you're the average yeah no the average human could not live in space i'd be willing to bet most of the people in chat if they were sent into a zero g environment would probably die within a week from like any number of internal problems that would just instantly flare up and kill you uh in the absence of like regular earth 
conditions. Y you need to be trained so much for that. Astronaut has ever pulled 600 pounds in space before, so the rowing machine is probably a smaller and more efficient way to get very Literally similar so. muscle activation. Obviously, the main reason that the crew is up there is to do work, conducting research and experiments that will help to further our understanding of life and the universe. With the addition of Meng Tian, the Tiangong now has a total of 23 experiment racks on board, with an additional 50 platforms for exposed experiments on the outside of the station. These experimental racks are going to allow them to conduct experiments on ecology and biology in space, fluid physics, combustion, material science, and the effects- Dude, th this is literally the fucking Kerbal Science Module, what the fuck? I know they've always done experiments in the ISS, but this is literally like, yeah, this is the room you go in to do science. And remember, the difference between science and fucking around is writing down the process and results. It really is. When you're in space, dude, do you think that, like, human Earth scientists have answers to questions like, what happens if you grow a, a plant in a dirt thing that you spin around a bunch for a while? Do you think they have an answer to that? No, they don't. They have theories, they have ideas, but we need answers. ...of varying gravity. For the external experiments, the Meng Tian actually has a specific airlock system that allows the crew to prep and experiment from the inside, and then load it into the airlock where an automated system will depressurize and send it out to the exterior where either a robotic arm or a crew member on a spacewalk can collect the experiment and attach it to the surface of the station. And then they can send experiments back inside the Meng Tian through the same system. We know that the next addition to the Tiangong station is going to be the Xu Qian module, which will be a robotic space telescope that can operate either while docked to the station or independently in orbit near the station. The telescope is still under development, but it is planned to have a 2 meter diameter primary mirror with a field of view around 300 times wider than the Hubble Space Telescope and use a 2.5 gigapixel camera. That's the equivalent of 2,500 megapixels. And it will allow the telescope to image- How do fish swim without gravity? Dude, I, c I so badly want to see a fish swimming around in a zero-G sealed aquarium. Holy shit. I have- I can't even fathom- Because it feels like they're already doing zero-G shit. Because they're floating in water. Like, like fish- Fish will swim at- their density of water so they're basically weightless anyway they got all weird we tested it what how do fish swim in zero g when a fish is taken from water gravity oh wait on earth when a fish is taken from water gravity makes its gills clap so they cannot get oxygen in weightless space these same fish might easily swim through an atmosphere of 100 percent humidity keeping comfortably moist what you're saying their gills would stay open and they would just swim through a high humidity zero G atmosphere? What? What? Oh wait, this is just an answer to like a space stack exchange. I need this to be real though. I need this to be real. Airfish. They can't move though? Well, they could move a tiny, tiny bit, right? Oh, we have videos. It turns out the effects of microgravity on Medica aren't much different from our own. The effects just set in much faster. For humans, it takes at least 10 days for the symptoms to show up. But according to a new study, the fish start losing bone density almost immediately upon arriving in orbit. Oh, well, that's not good. I guess that makes sense because fish tend to withstand higher Gs than humans, right? Because they swim down. Like, humans can't... Humans operate at 1G, that you can be fine at 2 a little, but, you know, we're those space anglers are still coming for you. Oh, shit, now we know how it works. The fucking space angler fish. These bitches. What the fuck? <laughs> what a video to skip through. dan 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 Uh, was that intended?
Okay. Uh, there are landing legs on this, right? We're not just gonna land, like, tank first. We landed tank first. You know, I feel like we could have done a little bit better with the design of this craft. Better. All right, Sparkles is okay. Maybe it's kind of hard to tell with fish. Much happier. He is alive. <sighs> Wait, you're all kids? Okay. All right. Mission complete. Okay. Just. Have a have a tank of four fish and just send one of them to space. Okay. Image about forty yeah, percent most advanced American space program. <laughs> of visible space over ten years. Beyond that, we already have word that China is considering another expansion to the Tiangong. Commander of the Space Station System at the China Academy of Space Technology, Wang Xiang, said recently that following the current design, China can still add an extension module to dock with the forward section of the space station, and the extension module can carry a new hub for docking with the subsequent space vehicles. We know that China is still sitting on a backup version of the Tianhe core module. They made two just in case something went wrong with the first launch, so that okay. could be added on to the existing structure to create more of a cross-shaped station. The extra space would definitely be helpful in opening up possibilities for more international cooperation. As it stands, there will be nine international research projects arriving at Tiangong next year in 2023. Involving 16 countries. Notably not the United States. Hmm. I guess the U.S. would uh, be interested primarily in, in promoting its own, um, in promoting the ISS. We ban China from cooperation. What do we do? The Wolf Amendment is a law passed by U.S. Congress in 2011 that prohibits the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, from using government funds to engage in direct bilateral cooperation with the Chinese government and China-affiliated organizations. Really? Without the explicit authorization from the FBI and the U.S. Congress? Okay, so it'll never happen. It has been inserted annually into appropriations bills. Okay, so we keep re-upping it. Okay, it's to avoid technology theft that China is known to do. I feel like there are better things you could do to avoid technology theft than lock us out of cooperation with China, like, period. You know? Yeah, they do tech theft, and that's annoying, but... Okay. Those are in collaboration with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs and the European Space Agency. So that's a great start, but with the relatively small size right now of the Tiangong, we're not likely to see very many international crew members up there for a visit. An expansion in the future could change that. Though we definitely won't be seeing any Americans involved with the ah, Tiangong. Well, okay. The same wolf amendment. Wow, we've just about to come up too. Okay that prevents the Chinese from ever visiting the... China's entire tech is based on stolen tech? Well, yeah, of course. They do that all the time. They do a lot of that industrial espionage, uh, industrial espionage shit. It, like, whatever. Uh, we're fine. Like, I, who, I, I guess, like, who cares? Like, NASA has some really cool space shit, so then they steal it and do really cool space shit? Okay. I know, like, national competition and all that, but, yeah, that's... I'm not buying that. Like, I don't care. International Space Station works both ways and would prohibit American astronauts from having anything to do with the Chinese station. So that's what life is like up there in the Tiangong. It's definitely a bit of a struggle to piece together because we don't get very much coverage of it from the Western media. And obviously, I don't speak Chinese, as you can tell from the pronunciation. So it this looks so fucking dorky, dude. Holy shit. As you this looks very dorky. I feel like um, maybe maybe Western media doesn't cover this because we're embarrassed by the lack of riz. This is a rizless space. What is this? You can tell from the pronunciation, so it can be tricky to decipher the information that is available out there. So 
Hopefully you learned something today. And if we missed anything, let us know down below in the comments. Meet hey. Oh, we learned a lot of uh, a lot of cool shit.